Hello and welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, I'm Nurse Alyssa and today we're going to be doing a Wound Care Wednesday. So today's video is on best practice of prevention and management of diabetic foot ulcers. But first, if you could hit that subscribe button, it would be greatly appreciated as it truly does help my channel reach more people. So let's get started, guys. So I am sure that you have heard of best practice wound care, and you may be a little confused of what that actually means. So that's why I've been creating this series of best practice wound care for each type of wound. Um, because when I was getting into nursing, I did find it difficult when a doctor wrote an order for best practice wound care. And it's like, okay, what exactly is that? And it's a little confusing. So um, as I gained more experience and knowledge in the wound care industry and went to become a wound care specialist, it did become a lot clearer of what best practice wound care actually meant. So today that's what we're doing for diabetic ulcers. So if we look here at the circle of care for best practice, we have five different stages. So assess or reassess, set goals, assemble a team, establish and implement plan of care, evaluate outcomes, and sometimes you need to go back around the circle and redo it again if a wound isn't healing or if you don't have the outcome that you were hoping for, you do need to go back and reassess and go through all the stages once again. So we'll start off on step one, so assess and or reassess. So number one, we are first going to select and use a valid assessment tool. So there are different foot screening tools that include sensation, vascularity, any deformities, areas of pressure. Uh, we want to look at footwear, skin breakdown, and infection. We also have different quality of life tools. Next, we want to identify any risk or causative factors that may impact skin integrity or wound healing. So we're going to assess for modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So we have glycemic levels. So hyperglycemia will delay wound healing. We want to look at activity because certain activities may not be appropriate due to the risk level, example, running, because running can lead to injury and interfere with wound healing. Smoking, it decreases blood flow. Trauma, um, so a loss of sensation due to neuropathy can make patients prone to injury or re-injury. We want to look at footwear because certain footwear can increase the risk of skin breakdown. Neuropathy is non-reversible loss of sensation. Bone deformity, this can result in high areas of pressure and skin breakdown. Peripheral arterial disease, this will increase the risk for developing ulcers and impact healing. Having a history of wound. If a patient has had a diabetic ulcer, they're going to be more at risk and more vulnerable for re-injury. Amputation. So ill-fitted prosthetics can cause pressure pressure in areas and this can lead to tissue injury. Then we have age. Age-related changes uh, due to the structure and function of the skin can result in skin that is easily traumatized and delayed wound healing. Next, we're going to look at the patient. So their physical, emotional, and lifestyle. So physical health, it's absolutely essential to have a complete medical history on the patient. This sometimes reveals if they've had previous ulcerations, if they've had any complications, if they have any undisclosed medical conditions or potential risks to wound healing. Next, we're going to look at vascular status. Every single patient with diabetes should be tested to see if they have peripheral arterial disease. Arterial insufficiency falls just behind neuropathy as a risk for developing a foot ulcer. Peripheral arterial disease is four times more common in people with diabetes than those without. And then we're going to look for bone or structural deformities of the feet. So foot deformities in patients with diabetes can be caused by changes in the nerves, joints, stiffness, altered biomechanicals, and previous surgeries. There are three types of nerve damage, sensory, autonomic and motor. Sensory neuropathy can be detected through monofilament tests. Autonomic neuropathy is identified by 
dry skin on the bottom of the foot. And motor neuropathy is identified by the lack of reflexes in the ankle and knee. Next, we're going to look at Charcot foot. So this is a major complication of diabetes. It is a progressive condition that causes fractures, joint dislocation, and destruction of the foot structure. Factors like peripheral neuropathy, increased blood flow, unrealized injury, and repetitive stress can contribute to the development of Charcot foot. Once triggered, uncontrolled inflammation leads to bone and joint destruction. Charcot foot can result in multiple fractures from normal activities, not just trauma, okay? These are normal activities. Increased warmth can be an early sign of inflammation. Early signs may not show abnormalities on x-rays, but bone scans and MRIs can be helpful to diagnose it. So failure to recognize Charcot foot or Charcot joint early can lead to severe deformity, ulcers, functional, functional impairment, repetitive trauma can elevate foot temperature. So self-monitoring and reducing physical activity can help prevent foot ulcers. Now, distinguishing between Charcot foot from infection, it can be challenging due to similar symptoms. We need to do a skin assessment next. So we're thoroughly going to assess the skin. We're going to focus on the legs and feet because this is where most problems occur, including the toenails. So we want to make sure that their toenails are cut straight across. We don't want to curve diabetic toenails. We want to just have them cut straight across. And we're going to look for any changes in color, pigmentation, texture, firmness, odor. We're going to check between the toes and on the heels for crack that could cause ulcers. We need to assess footwear, okay? So diabetics should be wearing specific diabetic shoes, okay? Um, I will have to link that down below here. So just look for the little Fitville um, in the description and that they have all diabetic shoes. They're really, really good. Um, I was able to reach out to the manufacturer and if you click on the link, you get, I believe it's a 20% discount. Um, um, I am not getting paid for this whatsoever. Just I was able to contact them. They have really good deals on diabetic footwear, especially for those who don't have the coverage to get specifically made diabetic shoes for them. So this is a great way to have diabetic shoes. Um, you measure your own feet. They have all the guidelines of how to do so. You step on a piece of paper um, while standing and you trace your foot out. That way you have properly fitted shoes. They um, do come in extra wide or just wide because diabetic feet, they do tend to be a little bit wider. And we want to make sure that our feet have enough room where we're not um, having any issues rubbing. They're made in a way where there's really no inseams. So there's nothing rubbing on our feet to cause trauma, to cause ulceration. So we want to always assess footwear. I did have a patient um, actually recently where he was wearing leather sandals, okay? And he didn't even realize that he had neuropathy where he couldn't feel, but he had these sores on his feet and they just happened to work out exactly where the straps of the sandals were, but the connection wasn't there, okay? They didn't know why these ulcerations were forming, but it was the footwear. Footwear is absolutely 100%, I feel, the most important thing that we can teach a client is that you need proper footwear. We should be wearing our shoes inside and outside, okay? So you can have separate shoes for that, but we want to make sure that we have properly fitted shoes for diabetes. We're also going to check for sensation. So do they have feeling in their foot? Um, so we can use a monofilament test and a vibration test. These will show if they have loss of sensation. So they'll close their eyes. You'll use a little monofilament to see whether or not they do have loss of sensation feet. Like I said earlier, it's kind of funny because a lot of people, they don't recognize it at first um, with diabetes that they're losing sensation because it's something that just gradually happens over time. And like I was saying, my client didn't even know that they weren't really having feeling in their feet. And so they didn't feel the rubbing of the sandal causing these ulcers. So it can happen quite quickly. So we want to do these tests so we can educate 
and give them the knowledge that, hey, you are having a decreased feeling in your feet. So you might not be feeling if something is rubbing. So if something is rubbing and you're looking at your feet and you're seeing changes, seeing color changes, you have to look further than just this came out of nowhere. No, what's causing it? What's the cause? Most of the time it is the feet. It is pressure. In places there shouldn't be pressure. It's it's the rubbing. It's the friction. Okay. So if we can give them that knowledge that, hey, yes, you do have neuropathy, then they have that knowledge and then they can be aware of it. And then we want to look at their lifestyle choices. We want to educate them on glycemic control. If we're having high sugar levels all the time, this will decrease the ability of our body to heal a wound okay so we want them within a normal reference range and that will optimize wound healing we want to look at nutritional status make sure that they are getting the proper nutrition for wound healing i always tell like to tell people eat around the outside of the grocery store okay that's where your fruits your vegetables your meat your dairy Everything's around the outside of a grocery store. All the aisles are very processed foods. We want to try to stay away from those as much as possible. I'll also link down below. I have a nutrition for wound healing guide. Um, if you want to grab that, it will help you. It is a general guide for nutrition and wound healing. We want to look at their weight. We want to look at if they smoke because smoking will decrease the amount of blood flow to the area. So if we can have them decrease the amount that they're smoking, a lot of times patients will not quit smoking for it's just the facts. It's what I've come across. We always want to encourage them to stop smoking. But I find for the most part, if we can decrease the amount that they're smoking, if they can cut out a smoke every day, just to kind of decrease it, decrease it, decrease it so we can get these wounds healed. I have a lot better luck with that than telling somebody to stop smoke. We'll look at activities. So activity, activities of daily living, um, their occupation, uh, are they getting exercise? Okay, we do not want to cut out exercise just because they have a diabetic foot ulcer. We want to make sure that we're offloading the area properly so the pressure is not on that area causing harm and that we can still get blood flow bringing oxygen bringing nutrients to those extremities we're then going to look at self-management and mental well-being so self-management we want to look at daily foot examinations are they wearing fitted and appropriate footwear and then how are they coping with having a diabetic foot ulcer or if they don't have an ulcer how are they coping with having diabetes Diabetes. Next, we're going to look at their environment. So social, economic, care setting, and potential for self-management. There is a huge financial burden to having diabetes, and this can create significant barrier for our patients. So we want to make sure that we're assessing, can they afford the devices that we're recommending, okay? Because um, a lot of times there are different options that we can use, like I said earlier, just like the diabetic shoes they're not they don't all have to be 800 to a thousand dollars you can get them for a lot cheaper especially if you do a little bit of the work yourself by drawing out your foot measuring your foot properly given all the necessary means of doing so but there are ways around it if you can't get these expensive devices okay these offloading devices there's are other things that we can do. So we definitely want to make sure that we are assessing for those means. And then we're going to do the actual wound assessment, okay? So um, jotting down all the characteristics of the wound. So there are three different categories of diabetic foot ulcers. So first, we'll start off with neuropathic. So we'll have a sensory loss. There will be callus present, and they're often thick. We'll have pink granulating tissue surrounded by a callus. Okay, so that's the ulcer. It'll be pink granulated and an ulcer will be surrounding it. We'll have a warm and bounding pulse, dry skin. It's normally located in a weight bearing area of the foot, such as the metatarsals, heels, and over the dorsum of the claw toe. Next, we'll look at ischemic diabetic foot ulcer. So a lot of times the patients will complain of pain, will have necrosis. It's very common 
You'll have a pale and sluffy with very poor granulated wound. You'll have cool absent pulse. So the foot will be, will be cool to touch with an absent pulse. There will be a delay in wound healing. It's often at the tips of the toes, nail edges, and between the toes and lateral borders of the feet. And then lastly, we have neuro ischemic. So we will have a degree of sensation loss. We'll have calluses that are prone to necrosis, poor granulation. We'll also have a cool foot with an absent pulse or a very um, minimal pulse that you can feel, high risk of infection, and the location of these ulcers are normally on the margins of the feet and the toe. So diabetic foot ulcers are the number one complication of diabetes that require hospitalization. Now let's have a look at the factors that increase the risk of diabetic foot ulceration infection. So a positive prone probe to bone test. So this is when you can probe and feel the bone, an ulcer that is over 30 days old, reoccurrent foot ulcers, peripheral arterial disease, previous lower extremity amputation, peripheral neuropathy, renal insufficiency, and a history of walking barefoot. So if the patient likes to walk barefoot a lot without shoes on, this increases the risk. Next, we're going to look at step two, so setting goals. So we want to set goals on either prevention or how we're going to heal the wound and whether it's a healable, non-healable, or non-healing wound. So after evaluating the risk factors and thoroughly assessing the patient's, the patient wound environment, it is important to set goals together with the patient their family and or caregiver. This involves considering different options and making informed decision. It is critical for healthcare providers to honor the individual's right to choose the interventions they most feel comfortable with. To stay healthy, people with diabetes should focus on preventing foot ulcers. And this means identifying things that can cause damage to their skin or slow down wound healing. It's important to lower the risk of neuropathy and peripheral arterial disease also. Next, we want to identify our goals based on the healability of our wound. Because unfortunately, some wounds will not heal, but if we can prevent them from getting worse, that might be a goal. So preventing wounds, obviously, number one. Um, but if we do have one, we want to prevent it from happening on the other side, okay, on the other leg. So obviously, it's super important that we need to make sure to check, is a wound healable? Is it not healing? Can it even heal? We need to base our decisions on this. We as healthcare professionals obviously always want to heal people. We want to see those wounds closed, but that might not always be the case, especially in diabetic foot ulcers. So some other goals may be stabilizing the wound, reducing pain, controlling bacteria, minimizing dressing changes. We need to support what they are looking for in regards to their goal. We can always make suggestions and we always want to do that. We always want to give them a full kind of outline of what we can do, what we we can help them with, but ultimately their plan of care is up to them. Then we move on to step three, so assembling a team. So we want to identify the appropriate team of healthcare providers and service providers. And we want to make sure that they have been specifically trained to work with those with diabetes. Because yes, we all have training and know um, generally about diabetes, but we need extra training and skills to address various aspects of care, such as glycemic control, infection, offloading pressure areas, vascular health, and wound care. So we want to make sure the team has all these aspects covered. Normally, when a patient has diabetes, the doctor will start setting this up and getting them in touch for the proper care. Now, as a home care nurse, there was a lot of times that I came in contact with patients who weren't getting the proper or didn't have the proper team. So all you really have to do as a nurse or nurse or healthcare professional working with these patients is just send a fax or chat with the general practitioner and just say, hey, I think that we should probably get a vascular surgeon or um, so, or, or, or a specialist of some sort, whatever you think is necessary. So know your team members, know who should be involved when you have a diabetic patient and that will help you. And it'll, it'll just really help you get in touch with the doctor and say, hey, maybe we should add this team member. We also want to make sure that we are 
enlisting our patients and their family as a team member. Okay, so this is super, super important and that we're educating them and teaching them on the importance of looking at their feet, um, being part of their care because they're with themselves 24 seven, right? We have to have them be part of the team. They have to want these goals as bad as we want them for that. That's why it's a total circle and their involvement is so important. So after we have established our team, everybody on our team, we are then going to go to step four, establish and implement a plan of care. So we want to identify and implement an evidence-informed plan to correct the cause or cofactors that affect skin integrity, including patients' needs, physical, emotional, social, the wound, the environment, and system challenges. So preventing diabetic foot ulcers are absolutely critical. Patients should be going in on a yearly basis to determine their risk levels of complication. So it's important for both the patient and the healthcare team to work together to monitor and manage factors that affect the patient's health, such as smoking, blood sugar control, weight management, the medications that are being used, physical activity, foot care, footwear, nutrition, revascularization, and pain control. We also have offloading for prevention. So a lot of times when we're assessing a foot, we'll look at high areas of friction. Now we can tell high areas of friction by calluses a lot of the time. So if there are thick calluses, now calluses in themselves, they are putting you at risk for an ulcer because it's almost like a hard rock there over time. The callus will start putting pressure underneath. So the ulcer will form underneath the callus and eventually open up. So if we're noticing these things, if we're seeing reason for offloading, we need to make sure that we are using offloading devices. Um, there are certain types of shoes, um, different types of footwear that we can use to off. So as you can see here, there are many different offloading options that we can use. Now all do have their advantages and disadvantages. So it just depends on the wound location and what we're looking for out of the offloading off. Okay. So that's going to determine which one we choose. And I do just want to mention for the last two here, they have to be very stable because there is a ch chunk of their shoe really missing either on the front or the back, um, just depending on the wound location. So if it's on the toes, there's not going to be any pressure on the toes here. Okay. Um, or here, if the wound location's on the heel, there's not going to be the chunk there. So you're not putting any pressure on that. Now they are low cost, but it is more difficult to ambulate. And then we do also have this chart here. So it's just the chart continued where it goes down to our shoes. So these are more of our uh, diabetic shoes. They're custom made footwear, custom made orthotics, padding, etc. Next, we want to optimize the local wound environment. Okay, so we do this by cleansing, debriding, managing bacterial burden, and moisture balance. So for cleansing, we're going to use a non-toxic, hypoallergenic, readily available. Um, we want to make sure that it is cost-effective and easy to use because diabetic ulcers are something that we're going to be dealing with for some time. We do want to um, keep costs in mind. So the normal wounds cleansers that we're going to be using is normal saline, sterile water, potable tap water, and liquid antiseptic. Next, we have debriding. So this is removal of necrotic tissue and biofilm. So there are different methods of debridement. So surgical, conservative, sharp debridement, mechanical, autolytic, or even a co combination of a few of those. Now, we want to be very careful with debriding for those with diabetes because we want to make sure that we do have a good blood flow to the area because once again, a lot of our patients with diabetes have peripheral arterial disease. Um, so we have to be very cautious. A lot of times if we have stable necrotic tissue, we are going to leave that on patients who do have diabetes. So we want to manage bacterial growth. So we want to evaluate for the signs and symptoms of infection using our nerds and stonies, obtain a specimen culture if there is suspected infection, selecting appropriate antibiotics, facilitating further testing if needed, 
and referring out to any specialist that they may need. I do just want to mention um, for osteomyelitis, this is something that's quite common. So infection of the bone, normally patients will be on IV antibiotics between four to six for this. Um, and we do see this a lot in patients who do have diabetes. And lastly, we have managing moisture balance in a wound. So choosing the right dressing for each stage of wound healing to keep the wound moist promotes healing. This also helps prevent infection and irritation to the surrounding skin. So it's important that we're picking the right dressing to maintain the right moisture balance, okay? So for these wounds, we want them just as moist as our eyeball. Now we'll look at advanced therapies. So there's really not a whole lot of data for advanced therapies and diabetic foot ulcers. So the main goals when you're choosing a dressing for diabetic foot ulcer is moist healing, removing dead tissue, relieving pressure, preventing infection, and maintaining a proper temperature. Now with that said, moist wound healing is contraindicated for the wounds that are ischemic. So if they don't have proper blood flow to the area. So we really got to be careful with that with peripheral arterial disease. If there's not a blood lot of uh, if there's not enough blood flow and we have an ischemic ulcer, it is contraindicated for moist wound healing. So for these wounds, um, a lot of times they are painted with povidone iodine and are kept just dry and intact. Now more for the advanced therapies, such as negative pressure wound therapy, data only supports these for diabetic foot um, ulcers when it is post-surgical intervention. So not just on the general diabetic ulcer. Then we have a uh, hy hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Now these aren't really recommended for neuropathic ulcers, but for ischemic ulcers, they are because we are bringing oxygen to that area. So once we have the plan of care done, we need to go on to step five. And after a certain period of time, we're going to evaluate the outcomes. So is our plan of care working to meet our goals? So are we progressing towards healing? If goals are not met, we do have to refer back to our wound prevention management cycle. So at this point, we would be reassessing the patient, the environment and the whole system that we're using to heal the wound. A study did show that a 50% reduction in size of a diabetic foot ulcer after four weeks is a good indicator that the wound will heal by 12 weeks. Next, we want to ensure sustainability to support prevention and or risk of reoccurrence. So we want to be educating our patients, making sure that they have all the information that they need, make sure that they're looking at their feet daily, make sure they're inspecting their shoes, their socks, looking for any slight changes in their feet and making sure that it's reported immediately so we can prevent things from happening and progressing further. We want to make sure that they are set up with proper foot care. So um, a lot of times diabetics will have really thick nails that are really hard to care for so that we're setting them up with somebody to clip their nails and clip them appropriately so we don't accidentally have these ulcers starting. Diabetic foot ulcers, they can have some very serious complications, including amputation and even death. So prevention should be our number one priority with patients with diabetes. So as healthcare professionals, we need to educate, 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 and making sure that they're aware and what to look out for because that is our top priority for really managing diabetic foot ulcers is preventing them in the first place. So that's all that I have for this video, guys. I hope you did find it helpful and I hope to catch you in my next one. Bye for now.